Hi, everybody. This is Megan Scheffling. I'm the Policy Analyst with the New York Association on Independent Living. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Today's presentation is around 17A guardianship. The way 17A guardianship process currently works violates the civil rights of people with developmental disabilities and traumatic brain injuries. Um, the Olmstead report, in fact, cited many of these civil rights violations. Um, so as a result, the Office for People with Developmental Disabilities, OPWDD, convened a work group uh, to look at this issue of 17A and how to possibly uh, address some of these rights violations. OPWDD has now submitted a program bill, S4983, and Niall, which Niall is strongly supporting. We have, however, asked um, an attorney from Disability Rights New York to break down the bill um, to discuss the current 17A guardianship process and how S4983 would address many of those rights violations. Today's presenter is Jennifer Monty. She is the director for um, the Protection Advocacy Departments for People with Developmental Disabilities, Traumatic Brain Injuries, and Accessible Technologies. She is uniquely qualified to give this presentation as she was a member of that work group and did participate in looking at all of these issues uh, and making recommendations to OPWDD. Um, she will today, uh, as I said, simply be educating the community on what the current 17A process is and what, what this bill would do to address those rights violations that were identified in the Olmstead report. Attendees today will be in listen-only mode, but you can, however, submit questions um, any time throughout the presentation, um, and our presenter will answer them uh, toward the end of the presentation. We will also be recording this webinar today, and Niall will post it up on our website within a few days um, so that you can refer back to it. Um, all right, so with that, I will turn it over to Jennifer Monty. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you for inviting me to talk about this uh, bill and its comparison to Article 17A. Um, so let's get started. So to give a little background for those that might not be familiar with what Article 17A is, Article 17A is a guardianship statute for individuals um, specifically for individuals with intellectual, developmental disabilities and traumatic brain injury. And the article is found in the Surrogate Courts Procedure Act. Um, so sometimes it's referred to as, as a 17A guardianship or a surrogate court guardianship. Um, it just means that the court where the proceeding would take place is in surrogate's court. There is another statute that exists in New York State that addresses guardianship for people who, um, for all people, um, and that's uh, Mental Hygiene Law, Article 81, and that guardianship proceeding happens in Supreme Court. And for those that aren't familiar with the court system, New York State's uh, trial court or lowest court is called Supreme Court. So that is where um, the Article 81 guardianship uh, proceedings occur. What most people will say about Article 17A is that it's a less costly um, alternative to um, an Article 81 guardianship, and some of that cost relates to um, the fees that are associated with going to the Supreme Court versus going to the surrogate's court, but also some of that process relates to the processes that the court has to go through when deciding whether to grant a guardianship for a person or not. Uh, it should be noted that People with intellectual, developmental, or traumatic brain injury may still seek a guardianship in an Article 81 court proceeding, but most um, tend to be in the Article 17A proceeding, um, typically because um, Article 81 guardianships um, often require some assistance from an attorney, and it's not at this point um, a an 80. I'm sorry, in a 17A guardianship, it's not something that that um, you often see a lot of. Uh, attorney involvement for the person petitioning for the guardianship. So with that background, we'll get into kind of the, the history of 
the Senate Bill 4983. So as uh, Megan said in the introduction, um, the discussion about what to, how to address some of the concerns with Article 17A um, has been happening for several years, but it really was crystallized in the state's um, Olmstead report, which came out in October of 2013. And I provided for you kind of the main thrust of the concern with the statute as it currently exists um, that I'll bring out some of the key elements that it's diagnosis driven. So in order to obtain a guardianship under Article 17A, the person petitioning for that guardianship would have to provide medical documentation done through what's called a certification of, of two physicians or a physician and psychologist that identifies the person as being a person with an intellectual, developmental, or traumatic brain injury. And the Olmstead report pointed out that that diagnosis-driven process um, is different than um, looking at someone's functional capa capacity, which means how they actually uh, make their decisions or live their lives um, shouldn't be, um, should be a, a larger factor that the court considers than whether they have a particular diagnosis or not. The other thing that, um, that the Olmstead report pointed out about Article 17A is that um, the presence of the person at the process where the court decides to grant guardianship is not mandatory at this point. So the court could grant a guardianship over a person without actually um, having the person present at that proceeding, um, which is different than the um, process under Article 81. And finally, um, the ONSA report pulls out um, the standard for which a guardian once appointed makes decisions. And right now, the, the Article 17A standard that has been used is a best interest standard, what will be best for that person, and does not require, although some guardians do, but does not require the guardian to examine what the person themselves would choose or the preference of that person. Um, and that's... Um, different than what is required under Article 81. So for those reasons, um, the Olmstead report recommended revisions in Article 17A um, to what they call modernize uh, the statute uh, to mirror some of the um, appointment processes, the hearing processes, the uh, capacity determination, and the consideration of the person's choice uh, in the um, 17A proceeding. So as Megan also said, uh, 4983 is a program bill, and just as a little history for those that aren't quite familiar with the legislative process, a bill can come from several sources, and one of those sources includes the governor's staff or department recommending a change. Um, once the bill is recommended, it's the responsibility of um, typically the committee that it gets sent to to decide whether they're going to take up the bill. So an executive branch can't um, force the legislative branch to actually introduce the bill, but the executive branch can recommend to the legislative branch that the changes that they think need to happen. So that is what happened with Senate Bill 4983, the Office for People with Developmental Disabilities submitted the bill and the Judiciary Committee and Chair of the Judiciary Committee um, introduced the bill. Um, it, it was also, it's also noted that, um, that the bill was, um, was simultaneously sent to the Assembly but has not been introduced at the Assembly at this point. So I'm going to spend the next, let's say, 30 minutes, hopefully, uh, talking to you about the, a side-by-side -side comparison between what Article 17A currently says and what the proposal um, of 4983 says. And some of the, I've, I've created for you, which is going to be available, I believe, up on Niall's website. You'll hear about it after I'm done speaking. A chart which, which uh, discusses the changes in what we hope to be very plain language terms. Uh, and so I'm not going to go through every change that the bill does, but I'm going to highlight a few of them for you. And the first one that I want to highlight 
is the term. Now, as statutes in New York um, are opened up again through new bills being introduced in the legislature, one of the focus has been to try to modernize the um, outdated and sometimes offensive language that was used to describe people with, um, with disabilities. So one of the first things the, the bill does is to do that, is to change the term and remove the, the term mental retardation and to, um, and to in, use the term instead uh, developmental disabilities and to insert the Office of People with Developmental Disabilities versus the Office for Mental Retardation. Now, um, some have asked, you know, why not insert the term intellectual disability? Uh, the statute still refers back to another section of the mental hygiene law, which is Mental Hygiene Law 1.03, which is a definition section. It's the same definition section that's used um, for the um, office for eligibility for the office for people with developmental disabilities and that definition section specifically says developmental disabilities so um, it does not have that section of the law has not been opened up yet and does not have a term for intellectual disability so I suspect the reason why intellectual disability does not um, exist in the bill is because there's no definition for it elsewhere in New York law and so without having to create a new one just for Article 17A, um, the drafters likely looked at what are the existing terms that, that are defined in the law. So next I want to talk to you about the basis for the guardianship. As I alluded to earlier with the Olmstead report, currently Article 17A requires two medical professionals which I've listed here, it can be a combination of physicians and psychologists or two physicians to attest to the fact that the person has a disability that makes them incapable of managing themselves or their affairs. And that's the standard of proof that the court needs in order to appoint a guardian. Our, the, the 4983 bill attempts to remove that medical diagnosis driven model and replace it with a different type of standard. And the standard is that the court can only appoint the guardian if the person with the disability exhibits significant impairment in general or specific areas of intellectual functioning or adaptive behaviors. And the purpose of the language here is to try to get it away from a diagnosis that the person might have and get it more to what are those areas of the person's life that um, prevent them from functioning um, or from making certain decisions. The one thing I do want to point out about the bill um, is that uh, the term traumatic brain injury has been removed from the statute's language. So, the, um, the 17A, Article 17A right now includes individuals who have traumatic brain injury, whether that traumatic brain injury might have occurred prior to the age of 21 or after the age of 21. The current uh, proposed bill doesn't refer to people with traumatic brain injury at all. So the other major um, change that happened, that would happen if um, Senate Bill 4983 was um, passed into law is what's called venue, which is a very legal way of saying wh what court, where do I go? Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with the court system, this, there are surrogate courts in um, numerous ones in, in um, they're not quite county-based, but they really are kind of numerous surrogate courts all over. Um, and so what has been happening with the current process of Article 17A is that sometimes a person might, might petition a court where the person who would like to be guardian is and not where the person with the disability is. And sometimes they might petition a court where the person with a disability is, but not where the person who wants to be guardian um, is. And so there was, it was unclear in the current um, process what court, what surrogate court does the person go to. So this bill would require that no matter who petitions the court for guardianship, 
that the court they have to select is in the county where the person with the disability lives or is physically present. That includes where an individual lives in a residential setting that's different than the community that they might have grown up in or where their family is. They still need to go to where the person with the disability is. There is a process, and this exists no matter what court proceeding you're talking about, where a, where a party to the proceeding could ask the court to change the court, to change the venue and, and change it because of inconvenience to the parties or witnesses. And that process exists. Um, the, the proposed 4983 just refers back to those processes that exist in every other um, court proceeding and their standards for trying the court has to decide what inconvenience means and uh, and what the the, the um, uh, where the action took place and a variety of things to try to change it to another court but the the burden is on the person who's trying to change the court to to prove that there is an inconvenience there. Um, and the thrust of this change is to try to ensure that the person who is going to be subject to the guardianship has the um, most ease with getting to the guardianship proceeding. So the contents of the petition, and, and I've listed on this slide the contents of the current petition. So when you when you are an individual who wants to go get a guardianship under 17A over someone else, you have to list a lot of information on the um, paperwork to the court. And some of that is the name, date of birth, and address of the person with a disability, the name of the person who's petitioning the court and their relationship to the person with a disability, and the names of other people that, that are um, close to the person with a disability, like their parents or children or adult siblings, and um, identifying whether they're alive or not. Um, there's a whole list of things. The, the new statute, which I don't have on the next slide, unfortunately, but I have in the chart, um, also talks about some additional things that would need to be in the petition. And it really just kind of targets certain people. Like um, they want to know, uh, the statute wants, uh, the bill wants to add like the, the name of the father, mother, and adult siblings. It wants to add to it anyone else who has significant and ongoing involvement in the person's life, who knows about their needs, um, and the um, uh, some additional things like that. So the, the statute, while it doesn't um, exclude uh, the contents of what's currently required of the petition, it adds a few more kind of details to it. And I can tell you some of the thrust between adding the significant ongoing um, had to do with um, some, some uh, service providers that provide um, assistance to people with, um, with disabilities and maybe if they, they do a lot of care for that person with a disability, having them be notified to the court that they might have information the court would want to consider when deciding a guardianship petition. And, and that be listed in the petition if the person who is seeking guardianship knows it. So the proof that's needed has also changed between 17A and the bill 4983. Um, so right now there is that the, that the proof needed is any information the court should consider on whether the guardianship is in the best interest of the person with a disability. So it's fairly general um, in terms of what is required right now. The, the bill removes that and requires that the person who's asking for the guardianship to be appointed um, have some specific information. So I'll go to the next slide and talk to you about some of that information. The next two slides are about the, that information. So in order for, um, for the person petitioning the court to complete the, the petition to the court, they have to list specific areas which the person is alleged to be in need of a guardianship. And the statement is that the, the specific areas um, which are listed on the next slide, the, the guard, in addition to the specific areas, the, the person petitioning for the guardianship would also have to 
say that they're looking for a um, total guardianship if they were. So you either have to say to the court, I think the person needs a guardianship in the following areas, or I think they need a total um, a plenary guardian, a guardianship over every area of their life. Here are, in the, in the actual statute, it lists those types of areas that the petitioner is supposed to comment on. So the ability to a consent to medical or other professional care, um, you see money management or property management, um, who um, the choices involving wh where the person is educated or trained or employed or supported, um, if, that, if the petitioner thinks that the person needs um, a guardian for that, for those choices, then they would check that area. Um, requests for legal or professional advocacy services, choices where they live and who they live with, choices of social or recreational activities, um, travel, um, private insurance benefits. You can see it's, it's kind of uh, very um, detailed what it means to identify those specific areas where a person might need um, guardianship. I apologize for the formatting of this slide. We'll fix it before we get it to you. The other thing that the petitioner would need to, do, to include in their paperwork to the court is a statement about the alternatives to guardianship. And some of this really is pulled directly from the Article 81 um, guardianship process. As I show you at the bottom of the slide, 17A currently doesn't require you to, to address whether alternatives to guardianship were considered and why those options were rejected. But there are specific areas of kind of alternatives that this statute is asking the petitioner to think about, which is a healthcare proxy or a power of attorney, um, whether rep representative payee services would be helpful, and, and that relates to benefits, um, service coordination, or other types of supported or shared decision-making options. Uh, so the, these are the things that the petitioner is likely to have, is going to have to, under this bill, say in their petition. So at this point, it kind of feels, when, when I went through the statute, um, I can see how someone who's not familiar in practicing this area could feel kind of overwhelmed by the amount of information that would need to go into a petition. But the statute does envision this concept of a form that you would check box things. Um, and so um, it refers back to the regulatory agency, which in this case would be the Justice Center to, and, and the surrogate to come up with a form. And some surrogates have already come up with forms that need to be kind of filled out. So the idea behind this alternative to guardianship is that the person that's petitioning for the guardianship would have to say, yeah, I've considered a healthcare proxy. I don't think it would work and check a box. Yeah, we've considered a representative payee and that doesn't solve the problem that, that I think the person needs a guardianship. So that's the thought behind the, the, the statute as it exists right now is that there are several areas that you have to really think about before you petition for the guardianship, but um, all that is required in order to petition is the person asserts, makes a statement, fills out a form that says, these are the things that I think the person needs um, to, um, I think this person needs help in these areas and they need to have a guardian and I've considered these other areas and I don't think they would help. So um, the appointment of a legal representative, it's, it's silent right now. Um, and what I mean by legal representative, I mean like an attorney for the person with the disability during the proceeding. Right now, the surrogate court process doesn't uh, mandate the appointment of an attorney for the person with a disability who may be subject to a guardianship. Some surrogate courts do. Some surrogate courts kind of don't. Um, under Article 81, the other guardianship statute, there's been court decisions that have said that a person is entitled to their own attorney if they're going to be subjected to a guardianship um, under Article 81. The Senate Bill 4983 makes it very clear that a person who is, who is subjected to a petition for guardianship will be appointed an attorney. The, a, the entity that's held out first 
is mental hygiene legal services, which is an arm of the court which represents people with disabilities. Um, it also uh, says in the statute, if mental hygiene legal service can't serve for any reason, that another qualified attorney would serve. And what they mean by qualified, they define in the statute, is an attorney who has experience with people with um, intellectual development disability. And um, it doesn't say traumatic brain injury, but it says intellectual and developmental disability. So what is the role of this attorney? It really has a twofold role under this, um, under this, this proposed legislation. The first is to figure out, the role is to figure, is for that attorney, and I'm gonna just use mental hygiene legal service for the rest of it, but you should know it's either mental hygiene legal service or another attorney who has experience. Their role is to find out what the person with the disability wants. And if that person with the disability can object or, or does object to the seeking of a guardianship, the attorney's role is to try to fulfill that person's wish to not be under a guardianship. So they engage in what's considered to be kind of a traditional attorney-client relationship with that person with a disability, and they go advocate and for that person's expressed desires. If the person objects, the court has to, at that point, appoint them as the, as the person's attorney. So mental hygiene legal, if you think about it as a process, uh, mental hygiene legal service will be notified that a petition has been submitted um, for guardianship, um, let's call it for Johnny. Mental hygiene legal service would have to go meet Johnny and find out what Johnny wants to do about it. And if Johnny says, wait, I don't want this person to be my guardian, then mental hygiene legal service would go back to the court and the court would appoint them as the attorney for the person, for Johnny. Um, if the person, so that's one route that could happen. If the person does not object, um, mental hygiene legal service or another attorney has to represent that person and just investigate the petition. So let's say they go to Johnny and Johnny goes, you know what, I would like a guardian to help me in some areas. What mental hygiene legal service would have to do is go investigate the um, areas that the petitioner, the person who wants the guardianship over the other person, said they need help in. And they then report back to the court in, a, in what's called an answer. And they say, yeah, court, I looked into this. I, I'm the attorney for um, Johnny. Johnny says he's okay with a guardianship. And I looked into the areas that the person is seeking guardianship over Johnny. And I agree or I don't agree with those areas. So the, for example, the petition says that Johnny needs help managing his finances, and Johnny agrees he needs help managing his finances. The petition also says they want to decide where Johnny lives, and, but I've looked into this as a mental hygiene legal service attorney, and I think Johnny knows how to decide where he lives, so I disagree that he needs a guardian for that reason. So mental hygiene legal service or the other attorney really becomes an investigator at that point and reports back to the court on whether they agree or disagree with the areas that the petitioner is saying the person needs to have a guardian. Go on to the, and then there's a third scenario. So um, the third scenario, which I've, I've, I could really laid this out, the, um, the person when they're, let me go to your first before I go to the third scenario. If the person does not object and the person cannot be represented by mental, mental hygiene legal service, the court has to appoint what's called a guardian at litem. And I apologize, that's the third scenario. So let's say that mental hygiene legal service goes and tries to meet the person and the person can't give them any direction. Maybe because of their disability, they are not able to find a way of communicating with the attorney to the point where the attorney knows how to respond to the petition for guardianship. Under that circumstance, the, the attorney would go back, mental hygiene legal service would back to the court and the court would have to appoint what's called a guardian at litem. And a guardian at litem is different than a attorney for the person. The guardian at litem kind of looks at the scenario and is, is uh, a little bit like an arm of the court. They're, they're supposed to recommend something to the court 
in that function. So they don't really represent the person with a disability, but they are there to kind of serve the person with a disability and make a recommendation to the court. And so those are the three areas that um, the attorney for the appointment of attorney might happen. One where the person can absolutely express their objection to the guardianship and they enter into a relationship where their attorney disputes the guardianship process. Two, where the person can direct their attorney but doesn't object to the guardianship process. And three, where the person can't give any direction and the court appoints this guardian at litem to serve um, to serve the court in the process and, and um, act in the person's interest. In all of those scenarios, the, the current uh, proposed bill allows the attorneys that will be serving in these roles an ability to access the person's clinical records in order to conduct an evaluation. And that includes um, accessing their physician records, their, their psychiatric records, their any other kind of medical records that they might have access to. And what the attorney would have to do is seek permission from the court, which is just a, um, an order from the court in order to access that information. Okay, so the reason why I talked about this attorney for the person is because one of the things that 4983 adds to the process is the thought that there will be uh, something happening before the parties come before the court. And that's um, a, a, pr a process that I'm defining as prior to the first appearance. Before the court gets um, greater, uh, has a greater role in deciding about guardianship, the, the proposed um, statute would, or the, the bill says that the, uh, the person who's appointed, whether it's mental hygiene legal service or the guardian at litem, when the person doesn't have the ability to direct the representation, should meet with the person who is petitioning for a guardianship, which is called the petitioner. And they should sit down and they should see if they could come to some type of an agreement. The purpose of this is to try to see if you could resolve it before you even went in front of the court. Is there some agreement that can be made between the person with a disability and the person petitioning for a guardianship or between the legal representative or the appointed representative from the court and the person petitioning for guardianship to say, this is the areas that we think the person might need a guardianship, or have you tried those alternative areas? Could you go try those things before you get back in front of the court? And the hope, I think, with this process is to, to maybe stop, it's almost like a dispute resolution, to stop the court proceeding until to see if everybody can get on the same page without having to come in front of the court, which tends to be a, a fairly costly process to the court. Okay, so then the next step in this process is called the first appearance. Now, there is nothing in the current statute, 17A, that talks about this first appearance. So 4-9, and I've now said that I've written the wrong number at the top of this slide, um, but the, the proposed statute, which is 4983, does talk about this concept of a first appearance. And it tells the court that they have to schedule an appearance in front of the court and that they would, at that appearance, review the response from the person with the disability, which is called the answer. So as I said before, the petitioner puts forth the areas that they think that the person needs a decision maker or uh, um, a surrogate decision maker, and then the person with the disability gets to respond to that called the answer. And at the first appearance, the court gets an opportunity to hear from the person with the disability and any changes to the papers that might have happened based upon that prior to the first appearance meeting. Um, what the statute also says is that all parties, including to the, the person with a disability, if they agree, the court will just issue the order that the parties agree to. So if in, before that first appearance, everybody sits down and everybody's in agreement, then that's the order that goes in place and the, and the court will just issue that order. If the parties don't agree, then the next step of the process would be to schedule a hearing. One of the things that um, that the the bill does is 
for that appearance, that first appearance and each kind of subsequent appearance in front of the court, the statute specifically requires that the person with the disability be present at those court appearances unless their attorney, which they're directing, so mental hygiene and legal services, um, says that they can be excused. And the purpose of it was that if you go back to the language of the Olmstead report, there was some concern that, that a guardianship could be, a, could be granted over a person without their opportunity to be present in the court system. In order to kind of better enable the process to work for people with disabilities who might not be able to um, be present in a courtroom, the, the proposed bill also says that the court has to conduct the processes, the hearing, wherever the person is, if there is a concern about them being present. So if it's not in their best interest or it's medically um, not appropriate for them to be in a court place, in a courtroom, then the court has to schedule the process where the person is um, living in order for them to be a part of the process. So that's the um, kind of the, the caveat to their appearance. It isn't that you excuse the person's appearance um, if they can't be at the court house, let's say. It is that the court has to accommodate their appearance by going to where the person is. Okay. So the the um, process, if it's gone through the first appearance and the parties just don't agree, then um, both 17A currently and um, Senate Bill 4983 says that the person gets a hearing, but the next process is a hearing. And um, the, the difference is that um, there was no standard of proof that the, that the petitioner had to meet specifically articulated in the 17A statute. What it said is whether the person, whether it's in their best interest to have a guardianship. The, the Senate bill says that the, the person seeking guardianship would have to prove by what's called clear and convincing evidence that the person need a, needed a guardian in the specific area. Now, clear and convincing evidence is not um, some other standard that you might be familiar with if you watch any criminal law shows on TV is beyond reasonable doubt. That's our criminal standard. Um, clear and convincing um, evidence is not as high as the standard for um, a criminal proceeding, which is beyond a reasonable doubt, but it is generally considered to be the highest standard that you might use for um, a civil matter, which this would be. Any, uh, any other thing, let's say um, whether the, the place that you're having the hearing is appropriate or not, and whether the documents submitted meet the standard, that has to be proven by a fair preponderance of, an evidence, of evidence, which is a lower standard than clear and convincing. So the only thing that needs to be proven by clear and convincing evidence is whether the guardianship appointment is appropriate for that person in those specific areas. Um, I know I, I could spend another um, three hours talking about the difference between these two standards and law students will you know, have to learn these things, but I'd like to move on from it. And I, if you have some questions about it, I'm happy to answer them. But I just wanted you to know that the, that the Senate bill introduces some level of proof that the person has to come forth with in order to get the guardianship. It's not just saying it's in someone's best interest. So the scope of the guardianship is another issue that is addressed within the Senate bill. Right now, 17A, and this has been um, battled back and forth with some of the more recent surrogate court decisions about guardianship, but right now the statute really envisions what's called a plenary guardianship, giving the, the total authority over either the person's life or over um, the person's um, financial or property to the person who's appointed for guardianship. What the Senate bill does is specifically say that the guardianship powers have to be tailored to the needs and limitations of the person with a disability. So it puts 
um, all the doubt of whether you can tailor a guardianship under 17A out the window, it specifically says you must do that. So that each guardianship that is being appointed needs to be specific to the person's individual needs. The um, specific areas that they're talking about is similar to what are the things that I talked about earlier about what the guardian, the, the petitioner needs to allege where the guardian, where a guardianship is needed. So there's that checkbox that I was talking to you about, about their medical and professional care, their money and property management, um, where they live, what the, where their employment is, what support services. Those are all those areas that, that the bill envisions that the order for guardianship would specifically say which areas the person is being given the authority to make the decision about. Um, I've got a few more here, where they live and their social recreation. You're going to see that they completely mirror the, the things I talked about earlier. So you can move on to the next slide. Okay. In, um, there is one other process that I'm going to introduce here. It's called a limited purpose guardianship. Right now under the 17A statute, for guardianship of the property only, you can go into a surrogate court and seek a very limited scope guardianship. So let's say, for example, um, Johnny's um, parents died and, and Johnny um, is about to inherit the house, but we need to set up a trust for Johnny to make sure that Johnny doesn't lose his benefits. There's a process in 17A where you can go in and say, I just need a guardianship to set this up and then the guardian will go away. Um, and it'll be terminated. It won't stay in place forever. It'll stay in place for this limited purpose. What um, Senate Bill 4983 does is expand the, the, um, the limited purpose guardianship to kind of any area. It can not just be for property, but it could be for person as well. So it could be for a single decision, and then the guardian would then go away. Um, let's say, for example, um, consent to admission into a community residence or something like that, and I just want a guardianship to sign the um, admission. Um, and it might be a bad example, but I'm trying to think of, you know, just a limited issue that we, we don't think the person at this point could consent to it, and we don't need any more decisions from a guardian after that, that um, one decision is made. Um, or we need a guardianship for a very short period of time, and then we think that the person might um, have some of their capacity restored, and then the guardianship would um, terminate. That's what um, 4983 is attempting to put in place with this limited purpose guardianship. Um, some of the other changes, uh, and, and this came up in some of the discussions about, um, I'll, I'll let you know a standby guardian is the person that, that's going to, there's, there's alternatives and there's standby guardians. It's, it's in essence who's going to act when the current guardian um, can no longer act. And one of the concerns that was raised was that there's little information that's being shared with the person who's next in line. And um, some of the things that um, Senate Bill 4983 does is to try to give more notice um, uh, to the standby guardian. Um, the other thing that it does is Senate Bill 4983 um, does not go back in time. So this would not apply to anybody that had their guardianship in place before the passing of the statute and the signing of the bill into law. But what it does do is when these standby guardians of these uh, guardianships that were put in place before the, the statute, um, uh, when into, before S 4983 went into place, when the standby stand up and say, okay, I'm ready to serve, what it requires is that they tell mental hygiene legal service about themselves. They say, I'm a guardian here, because it, in this case, mental hygiene legal service would not have gotten notice of the first guardianship, which happened before the statute um, went in place. I know that's really confusing, and I'll probably get 100 questions about that, but that's what that um, provision of notice is for. Okay, so once a guardianship is in place, 
Another thing that 4983 does, which currently um, 17A is silent about, is how it gives specific directions about how a guardian is supposed to make decisions. And so there isn't a decision-making standard um, in 17A besides what's in the person's best interest. And um, most of the language here came from, is, is mirrored from Article 81, um, which does have a standard about um, how a person should make decisions. But the guardian has to consider um, the desires, the expressed desires, the personal values of the person with the disability when making a decision, and has to encourage the person to participate in the decision-making process. And what 4983 does is it separates out um, those people who have um, guardians and are able to communicate in whatever way they communicate with their guardian from those that are not able to communicate. And it puts a more onerous on the guardian to find out what the person who can communicate wants, take that input before making a decision whenever the person can meaningfully communicate about what that decision should be. When communication is not possible, and again, this is a statute, so there isn't a lot of detail about what that means, but when, communi when the statute says when communication is not possible, the guardian, and the guardian has made reasonable efforts to find out what the person wants but can't figure out what the person wants, then and only then can the guardian use what's called a best interest standard. And they, they apply this best interest standard based upon the reason for and the nature of the action, the benefits and the necessity of the action, and the risks and consequences, and whether alternatives to those risks are available, and what the person, the guardian has to think about what, the, what they believe the person with the disability would have considered had they been able to make a decision, um, such as the views of their family or friends, um, before making a decision. So again, it's not, um, it's not the same standard that we might think about when we think about best interest of a minor child and a parent making a decision that they think is in the best interest of their minor child. This really is a standard about uh, applying best interest but considering the person themselves and how um, that guardian would think the person would make a decision had they been able to make it themselves. Annual reporting, and this is kind of, I think, the last section that I'm going to talk about. Um, there is um, no annual reporting currently in the 17A statute, but there are surrogates who do require annual reporting. It's a, you know, many of them have forms that you fill out. It's a one-page form that you kind of submit back to the court. What uh, Senate Bill 4983 says is that the person who has um, the guardian would at every year, um, or if the court wants it more frequently, um, when the court wants it, they have to file a report with the court and send it to the standby guardian, send it to the mental hygiene legal service or whoever the attorney is that represented the person, and send it to the director of the facility where the person lives um, or with persons that the person lives with. Um, and I think it was, it's envisioning, in those cases, it's in a certified type of setting, um, that report would go to all those people. And that what, it, what this, the bill currently says is that, that a form is going to be created by the Office of Court Administration. Um, I think that, um, that some court, like I said, some courts have already created the forms. The forms that I have seen have been these one-page checkmark type forms. Um, I can give you a little bit of insight that the thought behind some of the, the forms was that um, oftentimes um, when the unfortunate happens and the guardian is no longer able to serve due to their incapacity or due to their sometimes death, um, it's unclear that the guardian is no longer there um, and that a reporting um, process where a form was submitted to some people um, where it wasn't submitted might trigger a question of, is the guardian still here? Is the guardian still able to serve in that role? Um, so that was some of the thought behind it. But there is other thought, and, there, and, and some of that thought is that surrogates are requiring it right now, so it's now written into the statute. 
I don't think I have another slide. So check. Great. No. So um, this is Megan Sheffling again. Um, I, as I said in our introduction, Niall is supporting Senate Bill S4983, with which Jennifer just walked us through. Um, and we have posted uh, a lot of advocacy materials on our website, and you'll see on this slide the link to that, which includes Niall's Legislative Disability Priority Agenda, which has Senate Bill S4983 included on there. We have also posted the chart that Jennifer created, which really breaks down in even more detail um, these comparisons. And I think that it's uh, a really great resource for us to look back at. Um, and you'll be able to find it on our website. We can also send it to attendees on today's webinar. Um, in addition, Niall did just issue an action alert uh, in support of this bill in the Senate, looking for Senate co-sponsors, and so if you'd like to take action on that alert and share it with others, uh, you can visit Niall's action alert uh, site with the link there. Great, so um, I think we will go to questions now. If you have any questions, please type it uh, in the questions pane, and uh, I believe Sandra Horn here at Niall offices will read us out any questions. Okay. Sandra, do we Great. have any questions yet? Uh, yeah, we do actually have a couple Great. questions. Um, so Jennifer, the first question, what are options for families wishing to obtain legal guardianship of their disabled loved ones who do not have the monetary means to consult an attorney? So is the question about um, currently right now, or is it what it would be after if Senate, um, if the Senate bill were passed? Um, so they actually didn't specify. Maybe so I, maybe I'll answer both of them. Yeah. Currently, right now, um, most um, most individuals don't, in fact, um, seek legal counsel before before obtaining or for before trying to obtain a guardianship over their loved one. Um, and that I I think that you know if I read Senate Bill, it's trying to not make that a um, something that a family would have to do as well. While the person might be appointed an attorney through the process, I think that the, the idea of the first appearance and the meetings before the first appearance of the family is that that wouldn't, um, that, that that could resolve the matter without needing to have an attorney for the person petitioning for guardianship. Now, um, I can tell you in all frankness though, after that first meeting, if there was no agreement between the attorney representing the person with the disability and the family, and the family was really interested in pursuing guardianship over the objection of the person with the disability and their, um, and their uh, counsel, then um, it may be challenging for a parent to get a guardianship over that strong objection of their family member and their attorney. Um, and they may need an attorney to, to represent them. But I think that the hope of the bill with setting up all of these processes before you even get to a hearing is that you wouldn't need an attorney. You would sit down as a group and come up with a plan together. And then the family could decide if they didn't like that plan, maybe they go seek legal representation to pursue the guardianship the way they wanted it. Okay, great, thank you. And um, we have a, another question, um, this one, is looks like it's a little more individualized so if it's easier we could put you in touch with the person after the webinar but their question is a grandfather is taking care of his grandson with a DD the mother has passed away the father's in the military and gave power of attorney to the grandfather what else will the grandfather need from the father to become guardian well um, the processes that exist right now um, there's there's nothing that another person can do to give, let's say, the father to the grandfather to give the grandfather a guardianship. Um, the, the only entity that can appoint a guardianship is the court. Um, so the grandfather seeking a guardianship, the grandfather would have to go to the court um, and, and have the, gar the guardianship be appointed there. But it does sound like um, that the father was giving um, – which I'm not sure why the father was giving if the person was above the age of 18, um, 
power of attorney, but if the person's above the age of 18, then the grandfather would have to be dealing with the person, not with the father, because once a person reaches the age of 18, they, uh, they have their decision, it's presumed that they have decision-making decisions until some other process terminates it, like a court proceeding. So your, your age of 18 gives you that authority to tell somebody else, I want you to be my decision maker and use things like healthcare proxies or power of attorney, or to make your decisions for yourself. Okay. Um, we have a, a question here. Does an Article 81 supersede jurisdiction of proposed S4983 or 17A for that matter? If so, from a service coordination perspective, what would having an Article 81 guardianship established enable us from having to resubmit guardianship each time an individual would move from different counties or areas where the S4983 guardianship was already established? Okay, so let me, that, it's, a, it's kind of a simple but complicated response. Once you have a guardianship appointed, in this case, the, the, um, the scenario is in Article 81. The, no matter where you go when you travel within New York State, there's full faith and credit being given to that guardianship. There's no reason to go get a guardianship from another court. Um, so that this bill, if passed and changed in Article 17, change, if it changes Article 17A, would not impact any Article 81 guardianships that already exist at the time the pass. It would also not impact any 17A guardianships that already exist, um, existed before it was passed. The only time this bill would impact any um, guardianships that existed before it's passed is when the person goes back in front of the court. For example, when a standby is appointed, that means the next person in line steps up and wants to be guardian. The court at that point could decide whether they wanted to tailor the guardianship or not tailor the guardianship at that point. But this statute, if or this bill, if passed and it needs to be introduced in the assembly and then passed there and signed by the governor, does not impact any guardians guardians in Article 81 that exist and doesn't change the guardianship power of a 17A guardian that was appointed before it's passed. Okay. Um, we have a question. Can you send out the PowerPoint? So the PowerPoint will be available on our website and we can also send that out to participants. Um, uh, so we have a question. You mentioned the Justice Center and the question is what is their role in guardianship? Um, so right now in the current, and this is in the chart, in the current 17A um, statute, the responsibility for creating regulations is with the Commission on Quality of Care. And for those that, that knew about the Commission on Quality of Care, um, it, it no longer exists and was, and all the authority that the Commission had has been transferred to the Justice Center. So the bill says the responsibility for promulgating regulations about the surrogate healthcare decision process is with the Justice Center. So it's only for the surrogate health decision-making process um, that the Justice Center will be able to have responsibility for promulgating regulations if they choose to do so. So I know it's kind of confusing, but what happened with the, what I suspect happened with the bill is just whatever authority was given to the Commission on Quality of Care has been transferred over to the Justice Center. Okay. Um, another question, who pays for the lawyer for the person with DD or the first appearance, or sorry, at the first appearance? Okay, so an interesting question, and um, right now the, the bill does not have language in it that refers to the judiciary law about the appointment of counsel. I think that some groups that have commented on the bill um, say that it needs to, and under that process it would be, it's the same process as where a court, uh, an attorney is appointed for um, an individual in a family court matter or elsewhere. So the, the paying of it will come through um, probably primarily the court system. Um, there may be circumstances under which an individual with a de developmental disability has their own 
um, funding, um, so they, they have resources and it may come from um, them. But right now, I, while, it's get, where, while there's a gap there, I think that the intent was that it would be the same process for paying that happens when we appoint counsel in legal matters for um, other people, which is through the kind of court system. Okay. Um, another question. Can guardianship be amended if conditions for the individual change? So under the statute as it exists, um, under the statute as it exists right now in 17A, it does say that the person can come back in front of the court at any point, um, but the, the current 17A doesn't really talk about tailoring. Um, if you look at the um, at the Senate bill, it, it, it does specifically say that at any point um, when there needs to be more tailoring done or changes done, that, that the person can come back in front of the court for those changes. Okay, and does there have to be a standby guardian? Um, it's a really good question. I think that um, I'd have to look at the current petition, but I, under 17A right now, I do think that you have to identify, I don't think you have to identify a standby, but it's, it's, it's in, the, um, in the paperwork if you do have a standby to identify. Um, and I think the same is true. It's not really that articulated that clearly in 4983. I don't think you have to, but if there is one that you want to articulate, you can articulate it in the papers. Um, another good question here. Does the bill apply to corporate guardianship? So uh, this is the area of, so the corporate side of the guardianship is, is fleshed out. Uh, it, it does apply. I'm going to tell you that it didn't separate out corporate guardians from it. Um, I don't think that it made any changes, although I can look into it and get back to you, but I don't think it made any changes with respect to corporate guardians. Corporate guardians do have some limitations right now, and they, they, they didn't, the um, bill doesn't make any changes to those limitations of the corporate guardian, but it would apply, the same standard would apply, so the corporate guardian would have to make specific um, uh, make a specific petition about those areas that the person can't um, uh, uh, can't make those decisions, so it needs to be tailored, um, that the proof they come forward with would have to still be the level of proof that a family member that petitions for guardian does. So all of those processes do apply to a corporate guardian, um, but the um, who can be a corporate guardian and what can a corporate guardian do did not get um, altered or does not get altered by 4983. Okay. Um, who pays the MHLS attorney or the law guardian or other attorney appointed? So I think I answered that question, um, which is it's done through the, the court system and there are circumstances under which um, the person themselves, if they have means, but if the person themselves, person with a disability can't afford it, it would be like any other court process where an individual can't afford an attorney, but they're um, entitled to an attorney. Um, and, and, um, and so the, it's kind of individualized, but there is a, um, there, there is a, um, a court process where the court obtains the, you know, whatever, has, pays those fees type of thing. So um, for those of you who don't know what mental hygiene and legal service, they're an arm of the court. I think um, mental hygiene and legal service has commented on the bill. One of the comments was, you know, you may have to allocate funding for this bill because you're asking mental hygiene and legal service to take on some role without paying us to take on that role. Um, but they're an arm of the court, so it, it, it would come out of the court's budget in terms of um, who pays for mental hygiene and legal service. Okay. Um, a question. Uh, do you have any thoughts about end of life decisions if the person under your, under guardianship is seriously ill? Well, I don't have any thoughts about it. I can tell you that the bill does not impact the end of life decision section of um, 17A. That process is not um, impacted by this um, bill. The, I, I, there's one area where I think they made the bill makes one slight change to the the basis for family health care decisions. And um, it says that um, instead of um, instead of 
uh, the decision um, to sustain the treatment. Um, so right now, 17A says a family member can make decisions to withhold or withdraw life-sustaining treatment if the person with um, MR and DD makes them incapable of managing themselves or their affairs. The Senate bill says that they can make that decision if the person with a developmental disability has significant impairment in general and specific areas of functioning and in adaptive domains. What, so basically what it does is the basis for guardianship, which I talked about in the, I think maybe the second slide, that applies to whether you appoint a guardian um, under, um, under the, health, the, the family health care decisions as well. So that same standard, it won't be appointed just because the person has um, a certain type of medical diagnosis, but it will be appointed if that person has impairments in general and specific areas of intellectual functioning or adaptive areas of functioning. So that's the only changes that Senate Bill 4983 has made to the healthcare decision-making process under 17A. Okay, and I might be butchering this question, uh, but to clarify, when currently appointed standby guardians under 17A need to inform MHLS when they are ready to step up and could the scope of their guardianship being altered? Okay, so they don't currently have to notify Mental Hygiene Legal Service. Under the um, bill, the bill says that they have to notify Mental Hygiene Legal Service. The question about whether the guardianship could change at that point may have to do with what Mental Hygiene Legal Service does with that information. So, for example, could, could, I, en could I envision that once Mental Hygiene Legal Service is notified that Johnny is going to have a new, a new guardian, a standby guardian, could I envision Mental Hygiene Legal Service going and talking to Johnny and seeing if he wants a guardian? I could envision that. Um, and, and Johnny be saying, wait, I don't want um, my sister to act as my guardian. I want my cousin to act as my guardian. Or could the person say, I don't want the guardian deciding where I live, but I'm fine with ha having the guardian make medical decisions for me. So while the standby guardian, um, just the, the um, process of appointing a standby guardian under this, under the statute doesn't say that you must go back and look at tailoring of the guardianship, notice to mental hygiene legal service may prompt them to have conversations with the person who's under guardianship about the, um, the type of guardianship they have. Okay, and uh, we have one more question and then there's a couple that are um, personal questions that I'll just send directly to you um, after the webinar. But uh, would 17A continue to apply to people with brain injury? So that's a really interesting question. Um, right now, um, the Senate bill does not include, does not specifically include people with traumatic brain injury. Now, if a person obtains their brain injury before the age of 21 and meets the criteria for developmental disabilities because of that, because the injury occurred prior to the age of 21 and impacts them in their adaptive functioning, then, then the Senate bill would apply to them. But I do think that if there aren't changes made to the Senate bill to reincorporate people with traumatic brain injury after the age of 21, then no, if the statute, if the bill went forward exactly as it is, 17A in the future wouldn't apply to people with traumatic brain injury after the age of 21. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, um, so I think that wraps it up. Megan, I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to add? Uh, no, just thank you to Sandra for running the webinar. Thank you to Jennifer Monthly for breaking down this fairly complicated uh, issue of 17A guardianship and Senate Bill uh, 4983. Um, we will, uh, I will send out the PowerPoint presentation and the chart to all participants. However, Niall will also uh, archive this webinar on our site. And once again, you saw the link to where the chart is. Um, and thank you everybody for so many thoughtful questions. It's great to have such an en engaged audience. All right. Thanks.
Thanks so much. Bye.